Hi, my name is Daniel Ramadan. I am a Syrian Canadian author and I am the writer in residence at the Saskatoon Public Library. I'm broadcasting to you today from my home in Vancouver on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. And I'm broadcasting all the way to you in Treaty 6 territories in Saskatoon. As a newcomer, it is important to me to acknowledge those lands that I call home right now and acknowledge the generosity of the First Nation people who welcomed me and made me feel like part of this community. Today, I am inviting you to join me in the Public Salon. The Public Salon is this bi-monthly uh, series that I started as I'm doing uh, this residence in um, online, virtually, and it is a space where I invite uh, up-and-coming voices from Saskatchewan, from Saskatoon, uh, to read from their uh, uh, fantastic work and hope that you will enjoy this work with me. These folks are connected to Saskatoon one way or another and we are going to start with the first reader and the first reader today is Eliza Brodeniak. Eliza Brodeniak is a writer based in Dundas, Ontario and is currently enrolled in the MFA program in the writing program at the University of Saskatchewan. Eliza has had articles published in the Wondrous Affairs uh, Affair Travel Magazine and the Canadian Journal of Medical Laboratory Sciences. She is the co-organizer of the Caring and Connecting Pen Pal Initiative, which aims to uh, mitigate social isolation felt by seniors in care homes by connecting them with community volunteers. And I leave you with the fantastic work of Eliza. Hello, my name is Eliza Prodnick and today I am reading an excerpt from my story, The Last Dance. Harper was born on a bright, crisp summer morning. She emerged from her cell, bright-eyed and buzzy-tailed, one of many bees born that very day. Another worker bee, exclaimed the statistician Florence Nightingale upon seeing Harper chew her way through the wax film covering the cell. Of everything she did in the birthing unit, Florence Nightingale considered the, the, this the best part of her job. Her antennae bounced on either side of her mohawk, which was waxed into a single sharp point. Wonderful, the queen grunted. She shifted slightly in her royal seat, which was shaped like an open daisy. She let out a huge sneeze and an egg popped out of her ovipositor. A nurse rushed over and scooped up the egg, mucus and all, and plopped it into a basket. Any news of the dancer bee's safe return? Not yet. Florence Nightingale responded, I will keep you posted. Harper sat on the edge of her cell, drying her fuzz, stretching her limbs, and looking around at the golden yellow comb. It was filled with bees at all stages of development, and the smell of honey was deliriously delicious. The queen's face dropped into a deep frown at Florence Nightingale's words. Harper didn't think the queen looked as happy as she should be. As far as Harper was concerned, it was a perfect day to be a bee. Harper spread her wings, ready for takeoff. She jumped into the air and yelled, Yahoo! But nothing happened. Harper's wings did not respond. Instead of flying around the room like her instincts told her what happened, she flopped to the floor and lay unmoving and confused. Florence Nightingale's antenna drooped behind her ears. She gave the queen a knowing look as Harper struggled to flip herself onto her feet full wing paralysis, but strong. 180th today, the queen sighed. At least this one is alive, she should get to work. Harper tried to fly a second time. As soon as she opened her wings, she flipped onto her back and buzzed in wild circles. Maybe I am not meant to fly, she thought. She looked back at her wings, which were, like, which were bunched up like crumpled tissue paper. A tiny furry black insect with more legs than Harper could count climbed out of a nearby cell and onto her head. Harper giggled as the bug slid down her back and nestled into her abdomen. Harper was happy that the bug didn't seem to be able to fly either and that she had already made her very first friend. After receiving brief instructions, Harper joined the ranks of new bees cleaning out the cells they emerged from. The other bees seemed to enjoy their task their cells gleaming like lollipops after a good licking. As they worked, they sang the song of the worker bees. 
Busy bees in the trees, hear my song and follow me. Spin and dash a cartwheel here, lots of flowers blooming near. But not Harper, she lay in the spell cell she was supposed to be polishing and daydreamed about flying. Do you think I will ever fly? Harper asked the black bug, which now lounged in the wild fuzz of her belly. The bug blinked in response. I agree. Cleaning is a task better left to other bees. Harper longed for the open air. She sighed. If only she knew what the open air looked like. Working hard, Harper. Florence Nightingale's mandibles appeared in the mouth of the cell. Harper sprang from her fantasy, fumbling with the ball of wax she was supposed to be polishing with. The little black bug scampered up her body and perched on her head. You are a strong bee. I wonder if you might be better suited to another task. Florence Nightingale waved two strange looking baskets like gigantic backpacks in the opening of the cell. Harper had seen the nurse storing eggs in similar baskets when she had been born last hour. Would she be working for the queen? Maybe getting flying lessons? Her antennae vibrated with endless possibilities. I thought so, Florence Nightingale said. Come with me. Harper followed Florence Nightingale to the mouth of the tunnel just as a thin bee with wings like stained glass windows came sweeping into the hive. My queen, the bee yelled. The worker bee swarmed together in a deafening buzz at the sight of the strange bee. Harper stretched her head above the crowd as Florence Nightingale tugged her forward. What was the queen saying? If only she could get closer. Dancer. A successful waggle, flowers, the beast swarm turned into a frenzy, completely drowning out whatever the queen was trying to say. The bees' stained glass wings began to vibrate. The workers broke into songs. The bee lifted off the ground and hovered over the floor, its feet moving in an intricate pattern. The bees cheered, but none more than Harper. Wow, she definitely couldn't wait to work for the queen. Florence Nanka led Harper through a dark and narrow tunnel that ran between two combs. The walls pressed in around them and the ceiling hung so low that it almost touched Harper's back. Hey, Florence Nightingale, what was that bee doing? Something moved in the shadows and brushed against Harper's legs. She gulped and closed the gap between herself and Florence Nightingale. Harper didn't like this place one bit. She wished she was back in the birthing unit celebrating with her sisters. That was the last dancer bee in the hive, returned from a very long journey to perform a waggle dance for the queen. A waggle dance, Harper asked. The little black bug rustled in her fuzz. The job of a dancer bee is one of the most important in a hive. They scout out flowers so worker bees like you can collect the pollen and turn it into honey. What does that have to do with dancing? Dancer bees speak to flowers. Each flower has a special song that the dancer bee turns into a waggle. It is a secret that they only know. But worker bees can follow a waggle back to the flowers like a map. I can dance. Harper began to wiggle in the tunnel's tight space, chanting the song of the worker bees. The black bug, bug clung onto her antennae for dear life. Busy bees in the trees, hear my song and follow me. Spin and dash a cartwheel here, lots of flowers blooming near. Nobody wants the wiggle of a worker bee, Florence Nightingale snapped as they rounded a sharp bend in the tunnel. Besides, you have to be able to fly to dance. Harper continued to wiggle, so why is there only one dancer bee left? Once upon a time, this was a great hive Rivers of nectar flowed through these tunnels and we had more pollen than we could store in our combs. The drones the queen produced sired many great hives in this region. As time passed, things changed. Nothing is meant to last forever. Florence Nightingale gave Harper a stern look as she ricocheted off the side of a narrow corridor. Harper didn't think that that was a very good answer, but the look told her that she should stop dancing and not ask any more questions. After a few minutes, the tunnel became lighter and they entered a great hall. Sunlight streamed into the hive from the oval entrance beneath them at the very bottom of the hive. It was not what Harper expected. 
The comb was gray, not vibrant and filled with sweet intoxicating scents and cells of honeys and bees, like the place Harper had been born. The vaulted ceiling and intricate floral pattern carved into the comb were torn and dilapidated, a ransacked shell of their former glory. At least it was friendlier than the tunnel, Harper thought, catching sight of a swarm of black bugs moving over the comb, comb like a dust storm. The black bug on her back jumped off the end of her stinger like it was a diving board and joined the mass. Harper could even make more friends. Florence Nightingale handed Harper one of the baskets and helped her slip the straps over the, her front trochanters and tighten the harness across her thorax. All you need to do is climb down to the entrance and dump the contents of the basket over the edge. Florence Nightingale gave the straps a final tug before she began to climb. Harper landed in the entrance, a wide cave with a large opening at one end. Harper walked towards the edge. The scene before her bounded away in a series of rolling fields and pinprick farmhouses whose shadows were pulled and distorted in the afternoon light. The leaves of the poplar tree that shaded the high from the hot prairie sun rustled overhead. Harper looked up in time to see a massive brown and white bird burst from the greenery and into the open sky. It stretched its powerful wings to the sun and lazily glided in circles, higher and higher, caught in a bubble of air. Wowzer, she yelled. Harper's wings sprang to life, but she didn't leave the ground. She landed on her back, the backpack squishing her wings uncomfortably on either side of her body. Come now, Harper, Florence Nightingale said. No time for flying. Harper's antenna twitched with excitement. She rolled over and looked at Florence Nightingale. When can I fly? Never, Harper. Your condition is permanent. Now please undo your harness. Harper didn't understand what Florence Nightingale meant by permanent. She wanted to fly so badly. Maybe her wings need more time to develop before they got strong like the dancer bee. After all, Harper hadn't seen any of the other newborn bees fly yet. Actually, except for the dancer bee, Harper hadn't seen any other bee fly. She undid the buckles on her harness and dropped the basket to the ground. When she unlatched the top, she was surprised to find it filled with bees. I'm Harper the worker bee, Harper said to a bee with the same crinkle wings as her. The bee did not respond. It lay unmoving, its eyes staring blankly at some point behind Harper's head. Harper got closely. Maybe the bee didn't hear her. She opened her mouth and quickly closed it. The bee was dead. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Eliza. And now we move into our second reader for the night. Today's reader is Gunnar Oberg. Gunnar Oberg is currently enrolled in the MFA and writing program at the University of Saskatoon. He enjoys writing magic realism in grit lit, a man after my own heart, and reading and reading just about anything even the trashy stuff. A graduate of the University of Mississippi, he currently resides in Oxford, Mississippi. All the way from Oxford, Mississippi, not to confuse it with the one in the UK, here is Gunnar. Gunnar Oberg, Rednecks of the Universe. Maxwell Whiten hated his hometown. Deer Run was small, hot, Backwards, slow, racist, sexist, boring, and poor. It was the kind of town where players on the high school football team were treated like minor gods and where the hub of high society was a half-stocked Walmart. When the wind blew, it wafted the smell of cow shit for miles. Years later, Max would host lavish parties and tell his guests about the people of Deer Run, how they viewed sunburns and hernias as proof of their honest living, and how they talked about responsibility and accountability out one side of their chaw-gorged mouths, and that out of the other side, they blamed everything they didn't have or like on socialists, communists, immigrants, queer people, and just about every stripe of the ethnic rainbow. The guests would shake their heads and laugh when Max declared that people from his hometown were raised to be farmers and drunks and Baptists. Max entered middle school a four-time science Olympiad and amateur Asimov historian. He knew he was not like the other kids in his other classes. 
He loved books openly, kept up with whatever local politics his town could muster, and ate his lunch with the school's quirky eighth grade science teacher, Mr. Rollins, who had taken pity on the boy. One afternoon, Mr. Rollins told of a brand new government career, Space Ambassador. The position belonged to the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs. Even its acronym, ANUSA, sounded to Max like something from an exotic alien language. Max vowed he would do whatever it took to represent Earth at an intergalactic level. He did not want an extraterrestrial's first encounter with humanity to be with someone bumbling or primitive or juvenile. Someone like Dale Hammerson, the sophomore who got caught setting off firecrackers in the assholes of dead possums. Committed to this new career, Max earned exemplary grades and went to a good college up north where he continued to excel. He learned five languages, one of which was dead. He took extracurriculars he believed would further his qualifications and dated women active in nonpartisan politics. He would tell his dates about how the people of Deer Run referred to a certain president as that Muslim while pushing their carts around the Piggly Wiggly, and the dates would shake their heads in disbelief. Max applied three times to the Space Affairs office. On the third try, he was accepted. His job with the United Nations took him to many strange and exotic places in the world. He went on tours from Lisbon to Laos, studied indigenous populations in the Andes, and argued the socioeconomic ramifications of various guerrilla wars while drinking in tea rooms and hotel lounges. Max would often mention that he was from a tiny farming town named Deer Run. I don't even detect an accent, some would say, and Max would smile and offer to buy their next drink. Sometimes his mother would call and he would listen patiently as she told him about the summer's yield and how the football team was faring. Once, she called to tell him a cousin was getting married. Are they marrying another cousin? Max asked. What's that? I asked if they were marrying another cousin. Why on earth would they do that? Oh, never mind. Max discovered with some dismay during his years abroad that many of the towns he visited owned cows or other livestock. The smell of shit drifted through the breezes of Bolivia just like anywhere else. Families still gathered for conversation at markets and charted the same stars for the same reasons. Nothing was different but the names of the stars. Sometimes other cultures laughed at him just like the people of Deer Run. He heard it when his hand-tailored boot sunk halfway into a fresh pile of ox droppings. He heard it when a cockatoo flew out from a low tree branch, startling him and causing him to drop his machete. He heard it from his tour guide the time he mistook a prostitute for a beggar and gave her what his guide later told him was enough for a vigorous blowjob. Just imagine, thought Max, if these were the kinds of people a high race met first. He was mortified. After decades of patience and hard-won promotions, Max Wyden was ambassador of Earth. Three years later, he was awakened in the middle of the night by a phone call. Dr. Whiten, said the voice on the phone. Yes, what time is it? Big day for you, doctor. We've just put the coordinates in your phone. Why, what happened? Turn on the news and you'll see. We need you in Kansas immediately. Congratulations and Godspeed. The spacecraft was shaped like a bullet and no larger than a mid-sized SUV. It was parked on a hill surrounded by flat Midwest fields. Standing in front of the ship were two creatures a few feet taller than most humans, their skin pink as gum erasers. The creatures had thin eyes and wide mouths and appeared to communicate to each other with clacking noises. It seemed to Max like they were bickering. His UN colleagues had wanted to dress Max in every award they could think of and make him look like a general, but he had discouraged this. He explained that he wanted to appear as meager and unimposing as possible so as not to intimidate Earth's visitors with his credentials. Instead, he was dressed in a modest navy suit that felt very uncomfortable in the heat of a Kansas summer. His outfit seemed to shrink in the humidity, sticking and grabbing in places he could not address with any modicum of dignity. Nonetheless, he was elated. This was his dream, his destiny. The two aliens stopped clacking and watched Max cautiously approach them. Behind him, dozens of tanks and hundreds of soldiers stood at attention, watching for even the slightest sign of trouble. Max thought they looked pointlessly aggressive. 
Any organism smart enough to traverse the galaxy could easily dispense of something as ineffective and earthbound as the United States military. The aliens treated a short volley of clacks between them, and then one of them stepped forward to greet Earth's ambassador. Around its neck was a metallic collar from which two thin rods protruded and held in front of its mouth a slender metallic device that looked something like a harmonica. Max stopped a few yards from the alien. He held his hands open in front of him in what his government education told him was a safe and non-threatening gesture. We welcome you in peace, he said. The alien held its hands out in a position similar to Max's and produced a burst of violent clacks. Before Max could reply, the other alien started squawking. The first alien turned to listen, then faced Max again and hit a button on the contraption in front of its mouth. All <clears throat> right, sorry about that, it said. Forgot to turn the darn thing on. I said I'm glad we finally found someone willing to talk with us. We welcome you in peace, Max said, slowly enunciating each word. Ah, fantastic. Well, my sweetheart over there and I were hoping you could help us with a little problem. Max smiled. He was conversing with an extraterrestrial species. It was happening. It was really happening. The people of Earth will assist you with anything we can. We are your friends. My name is Maxwell Whiten. I am this planet's representative. Earth? Is that what you call this place? Yes, Earth. I am its ambassador. We welcome you here. <laughs> You're very kind, said the alien, but really we weren't planning on staying. We were going to this festival in Existiklech and got a little lost. Thought maybe you could help us. Help you? Yes, I think we're just a few quadrants from it. Pretty sure. You know the place? Existiklech. Big... Ball of gas, inverted temporal relativity. Inverted, what? The manipulation of time. Surely you've heard of this. Uh, how else would anyone travel the galaxy? Max was speechless. You, you do know how to travel between galaxies, don't you? Asked the alien. You mean you've never, oh, oh dear. Oh, I suppose this is all rather unsettling for you, then. Well, that explains the fanfare behind you. I must appear rather alien. There was a tone in the alien's voice of sincere pity. Max had never trained for this. Earth, he said. This is Earth. My name is... Hold that thought a moment, would you? The other alien was squawking loudly. The first alien hit a button on its device and clacked rapidly in its native tongue over its shoulder. It turned the device back on. My sweetheart says we're in the wrong dimension, it said. So embarrassing. This is what happens when one of you, it gestured with its head to the other alien, refuses to use directions. Well, we best be off then. Sorry for the trouble. You're leaving? Max asked. No, please, don't go. I'm sorry, the alien said. We've traveled for hundreds of years the past few days, and we're just very anxious to get to the festival. You understand. But you could teach us. We could learn to travel like you do, join you in exploring the universe. <laughs> join us? said the alien, then gave what Max could not mistake for anything other than laughter. <laughs> That's wonderful. No, not for another... I'd say a few thousand years anyway. Thank you for the offer though. The universe isn't that great, believe me. Boring in most places and cold. Well, we must be off. You have a delightful rest of your day. The alien nodded and headed back toward its ship. It touched the side of the craft and a door slid open. Before boarding, it turned to face Max one last time. Really is a nice place you have here, it said. Very, Rustic. The alien boarded and, with a short sucking noise, the spacecraft folded into itself and disappeared. Max stared at the ground where seconds before there had been an alien. He turned and looked down the hill at the rows of armed men and the tanks behind them, the police and the government officers and reporters and spectators, the plains and acres of crops and farmland beyond. 
Inverted temporal relativity, he thought. What the hell is that? A breeze blew by him, carrying with it the faint smell of cow shit. Thank you so much, Gunnar. That was fantastic. I really appreciate it. And now for our final reader of the night, we bring you Kevin Wessegard. Kevin is a spoken words poet and visual artist who's currently employed as a multidisciplinary indigenous arts leader at SCYAP. Kevin is the founder of Indigenous Poetry Society with hopes of building a larger community of spoken word trusts. Kevin represented Saskatoon at the Canadian Individual Slam in Vancouver in April 2018 and once again in 2020, as well as represented tonight its poetry for the Canadian Festival of Spoken Words in 2017 and 2018. He recently finished the Indigenous Fine Arts Residence in Banff Centre for the Arts called Ghost Days Making Art for the Spirit 2019. I leave you with the fantastic art of Kevin and I hope you will enjoy it. This poem is dedicated to the children at St. Francis Cree Bilingual Elementary School who are nearing a 150% capacity. Your words are powerful and my words are said. Your words have been dancing to the new notes in my head. My words are like the trees of autumn days, like leaves that leave me in so many different ways. Your words are like a spring runoff where they're trickling out and they're bringing new meaning in life. Well, my words have been sustaining me all of these long winter nights. Your words are like a summertime heat. They're vibrant and new while mine sit back, reflecting the cold days of gray hues. And I imagine your future in open land untouched by man while I harvest my own and I try my best to understand. And I envision a day when we could all speak your two languages. Like some sort of ancestral prophecies, we could all come to know the way of the Nahewak poet, naturally speaking, naturally living, naturally sharing metaphors and similes on hand drums near urban street corners, by Nahewak owned businesses on main streets, by Nahewak owned homes on side streets where poetry is taught in native schools on native tongues. And we wouldn't have to worry about prejudice or hate because it would all be beyond that. You see, <clears throat> I envision your future a beautiful one because your future is bright and nature has been known to change. You see, it would be too busy trying on our latest traditional fashions all up and down the block from ribbon shirts to ribbon skirts. And I imagine a place where we could one day trade in these protein bars for pemmicans. Where we could pick wild berries in our communities. Where diabetes is on the decline thanks to the return of our medicine keepers and our indigenous diets. I imagine a place where young men could let out their hair like warriors of the past only now wearing suits and ties. I envision a place where children could play in the parks near dark, free of gangs and crime. I envision a place where beadwork is valued and honored over gold and diamonds. I envision a place where <clears throat> our elders are no longer suffering from homelessness and begging for change. You see, we'd house them in the best and place them on top of everything. And if a child only speaks their Neheao tongue, we would regard them as royalty out here on these prairies, and it's you, young native poets. I am honored to have been your momentary teacher of poetry, and I'm so excited to listen to you read out loud. Your wonderful words gives me hope, and it gives me so many reasons to be proud. Your words are valuable like a baby's first cries, and somehow I hope they help me realize that our short time together was well spent and I'm glad to know that you could go on practicing your new poetry skills in two languages as I only know this one and you see my belly is nearly full and yours has yet to taste this beautiful world
So let your spoken words fancy dance near my inner eardrum and swift to my heartbeat. And let your spoken words lead you out into that open land. And don't be afraid and don't look back, young native poets, because this is where I make my stand. Oh. This poem is called Shapeshifter. I practice my dark magic in secret far off places. I whispered to the winds, my chants echoing over prairie fires. After my chores, of course, I had a childhood ripe with watering the horses, cleaning the yard, feeding the chickens, sharpening the axes, mending the fences, clearing the brush. Neomosum appreciated as clear as Saskatchewan sunsets. Tirelessly, I've been called a dog of the reservation. With no business around the yards, his purebreds had cool-sounding names like Rocket, Pepper, or Lucky, while well, my name was always just Kevin. Pastor to yard, sniffing, digging, barking, barking, ruff, 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 ruff. shamelessly chasing horses and dodging kicks and always coming back with crooked-shaped sticks that resembled the rifles on the walls or even the animals of the land. And this is what reaffirmed my childhood shapeshifter ways. It allowed me to be sneaky and clever. Afternoon bingos left me in an empty house. I snuck in, of course, steady like a mouse. And I creeped through dusty photo albums in awe of old days gone, guessing of Neomosum's adventures, sitting in his favorite chair by the window, passing time playing checkers with the clouds and wishing the warmth from the sun, was my grandfather's hugs, these first memories of a shapeshifter child, until I got brave with my shapeshifter ways, turning into a black fly sitting a upon the kitchen wall, watching Cookum's cooking, waiting to steal a taste, buzzing and teasing on by with my mischievous sounds, majestic, fresh cinnamon apple pies, wooden tables, and I'm so agile and I'm so able, hovering above the stove, cooking potatoes, dancing around old time, and carrots tossing about, so tasteful, and always surprising me how she decidedly mixed it up with flavors of cows, chickens, and pigs, deliciously and gracefully, Switching it up, of course, with these courses of natural flavors like rabbit, duck, and deer. Oh, I was one lucky shapeshifter child, and not a moment of boredom living in the old ways, feeling genuine indigenous love, and even to this day, a proud and wild child remains, reminiscing of childhood shapeshifter days. Thank you so much, Kevin. I really appreciate it. And uh, that brings us to the conclusion of the night. I really appreciate the time that you spend with me. I really appreciate all that you do to ensure that this residence of mine is as successful as it could be, even virtually. And um, I thank you um, from all of my heart. This is our last uh, video for 2020 and hope to see you again in 2021. Until then, cheers.